I'd, is the Senate in a quorum call? We are. I'd ask this, the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. I wanted to come down here because um, a single senator in this chamber, our colleague from Alabama, has put a blanket hold on every pending nominee and promotion of flag officers at the Department of Defense. As far as we can tell, and this might be the intention of the senator from Alabama, I don't know or whether he knows this or not, there is no precedent for what the senator from Alabama is doing. No precedent for what he has done. It has never been done. Stopping the U.S. Senate from taking up promotions for uniformed military officers. These are the promotions that happen for people as a group, flag officers at the Department of Defense that we have to ratify here in the Senate. And we asked the Senate Armed Services, I couldn't believe it when I heard this. Couldn't believe it. But we asked the Senate Armed Services Committee if this had ever happened in the history of America, the history of the Senate. And the answer was, they have no record of that ever happening before. And it's happening at an incredibly unusual and difficult time in the world's history, with the biggest land war in Europe since the Second World War, China's saber rattling in the Pacific. We just had an hour-long set of hours long open session of the Intelligence Committee to hear the report from the head of the FBI, the head of the CIA, the head of the NSA, the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, all of these folks coming together to say, this is what the threat looks like. This is the global threat that America faces, a geopolitical landscape more unsettled than at any point in my lifetime. Madam President, and my understanding is that the senator from Alabama has placed this unprecedented blanket hold because he objects to the Department of Defense's new policies to help our service members access reproductive care. And I'll have more to say about that in a minute, but I don't think I should wait any longer to advance these personnel. We should get this done today. Madam President, and, and therefore I ask, I'm sorry, let me find my glasses, Madam President. I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to executive session to consider the following nominations on block. Calendar numbers 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52. That the nominations be confirmed on block. The motion to be reconsidered be to consider be to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate, that no further motions be in order to any of the nominations, that the President be immediately notified of the Senate's action, and the Senate then resume legislative session. Is there objection? Madam President. The senior senator from Alabama. Reserving the right to object. Senator from Colorado may have good intentions, Madam President, but he's wrong on the facts. I'm holding the DOD nominations because the Secretary of Defense is trying to push through a massive expansion of taxpayer subsidized abortions without going through this body, without going through Congress. Three months ago, I informed Secretary Austin that if he tried to turn the DOD into an abortion travel agency, I would place a hold on all civilian flag and general officer nominees, other than a couple of calls to my staff to ask whether I was serious. The DOD leadership has yet to call me directly and justify this action. In fact, they have not explained this decision to Congress despite multiple letters, more than a dozen from my colleagues on the Armed Services Committee. Secretary Austin's new abortion policy is immoral and arguably illegal. 
If he wants to change the law, he needs to go through Congress. The DOD refused to answer questions or justify this policy for months last year. When they finally answered our questions after another nominee hold, the policy was exposed for what it really is, nothing but a political charade to appease the left. These holds have no real impact on military readiness or operations. The military wasting time and resources to coordinate abortion trips hurts readiness, not the Senate using regular order to vote on nominees. If my colleague cared about military readiness, maybe we'd go after more of the ridiculous policies that have led to our lowest, our lowest recruiting numbers in decades. But my hold does send a message that the secretary is not, and I repeat, not above the law. And he cannot ignore lawmakers who are demanding his organization abide by the law. I object, and I will continue to object to any nominees as long as this illegal new abortion policy is in place. I'm holding the military accountable. Others are holding our national security hostage by forcing their agenda where it doesn't belong. Americans want a military focused on a national defense, and that's what I'm fighting for. For these reasons, I object. Objection is heard. Madam President. The senior senator from Colorado. Thank you. I appreciate the, the words of the uh, senator from Alabama and his conviction. I will say, he said that I'm mistaken on the fact. I think one thing we didn't hear was any dispute at all that this is the first time in American history that a United States senator has held up the promotion of flag officers. The first time. The first time in American history that any of the more than 2,000 people that have served in this body, but less than 3,000 people, have seen fit to hold up the promotions of people at DOD. That's not a, a fact that's in dispute, Madam President. as we sit here today on the floor. You know, I, I spend a lot of time when I come down to this floor uh, and I'm on the floor listening to people's speeches or I'm thinking about my own, thinking about the history of America. And broadly speaking, it's not always been true at every moment or at every juncture, but broadly speaking, the American story has been a story of expanding freedoms and expanding opportunity for the American people. It's the story of one generation after another putting their shoulder to the wheel to make our country more democratic, more fair, and more free. And it can be easy when you're on this floor to think about those victories as ancient history, as old as the marble in this chamber. But it was only 100 years ago, our grandmother's generation, our grandmother's generation, when women in America didn't have the right to vote. That's just 100 years ago. It took 100 years for the people that were fighting for women to have the self-evident right to vote to vote, and they didn't get it until 100 years after they fought, and, and it was only 100 years ago that they got it. It was only when I was born, in the middle of the 1960s, that we attempted, finally, Finally, after the Civil War in the United States, after Reconstruction and then the redemption that came after that, after the Jim Crow laws and the redlining that had happened in the United States of America, it was only after that that we finally tried to secure the rights of African American citizens to vote, a promise that had been made after the Civil War was over and never fulfilled. I would argue it hasn't been fulfilled to this day. And by the way, when I was born in 1964, I was at the African American Museum the day before I got sworn into this body this time with my family. And I said to one of my nephews, we were walking through the slavery exhibit, I said to him, you know, 
I was born in 1964, which to him, that did seem, admittedly, that seemed like ancient history. But the year I was born was just 100 years since people in this country still enslaved human beings. Just a hunt, two short lifetimes divided from when I was born from when we still enslaved human beings. And it was even more recent in our country's history, just 50 years ago, Madam President, before we secured the constitutional right to an abortion in Roe versus Wade, putting an end to the days when women in this nation When our mothers and our grandmothers were forced into back alley abortions in the United States of America, forced to carry pregnancies to term, and forced to live without any freedom to chart the own course about their lives or their family's life. That was just 50 years ago when the court in Roe versus Wade said, there's a constitutional right at stake here. There's a constitutional right that we're going to protect here. And in all of these cases, in my judgment, our fellow citizens have sought to broaden the horizon of freedom and equality in America, and our progress has never been in a straight line. The pages here should know that. We've always been in a battle. We've always been in a battle in this country between the highest ideals that have ever been expressed on the page by human hands, the words in the Constitution of the United States, and the worst impulses in human history. The worst impulses in human history. In our case, human slavery and the genocide that was perpetrated on the Native American population that was here at a time when those incredible words were etched into the Constitution that are etched all over the walls of this beautiful building, a building, by the way, that itself, I say to the pages that were here, was built by enslaved human beings. And we are in that fight today. Today we face a decades-long campaign that stretches back at least to when Ronald Reagan was elected president. It's a battle that's been mostly invisible until recently to the American people, even though it has transformed American life. And, and while that campaign had many objectives over its 40 or 50 years or so, those four decades, one of those objectives was to confirm a majority of justices on the Supreme Court who subscribe to a radical constitutional interpretation called originalism, a legal doctrine that was invented in the 1970s. My colleague from Louisiana is here today. He's a distinguished lawyer. He might disagree with some things that I would say, but I was at the, there at the origin of originalism. I was a lawyer trained at a, at a decade or so after this was something that, you know, was perpetrated by the Federalist Society and Antonin Scalia and the law and economics guys and, the, and Martin Feldstein and all these folks as part of what they were trying to do with the Reagan Revolution. And a ma huge part of that was originalism which they, it was the most amazing name, it's the most amazing name, I think, in political history. I don't think there has been greater branding in the history of mankind than originalism, because it makes you think immediately, that's what the Founding Fathers must have said. It's their original intent, as if that could be divined across the decades or across the centuries or across the ages, as if they even agreed with each other. You don't have to go to the mu a musical like Hamilton to see the disagreements that these people had with one another. That's the beauty of the founding of our republic, is to see the disagreements that they 
had with each other and the way they sorted through them and the compromises that they made as a result of those disagreements, some of them American tragedies that we live with to this day. But they called it originalism. And I just want the pages to know this and the law students that are out there today that might want to dispute this to just look up the history. There's a beginning of this. There's a beginning of this, and it does not start with John Marshall. It does not start with George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, who himself, in Jefferson's case, would be absolutely shocked to believe that there are people in the 21st century who think that we should be dictated to by the hand of the 18th century or the 17th century. He thought there should be a revolution even less than in every, every generation. And, and if you had told me, I mean, we all knew about originalism when I was in law school. We certainly did. I did. We professors who subscribed to it. Certainly political people who subscribe to it. But if you had told me that when I was in law school, I would live to see the day when a majority of the United States Supreme Court would subscribe to the originalist position of the Federalist Society, I would have said, that is not believable. That is preposterous. I'm not saying there wouldn't be people that would, wouldn't have fundamental constitutional disagreements with me on all kinds of things. But the idea that you'd have a court that would say originalism is where it's at, but that's what's happened. And it has been a 40-year campaign to do it. I actually had a moment on the floor of this Senate once when I congratulated the leader of the Republican Party for having achieved his dream, having achieved his vision. I wasn't congratulating him because I agreed with him or that I felt positive about what he had done, but he had set out to carry that water and he did it decade after decade after decade. And I said earlier that this wasn't really noticed by the American people, this battle, in many ways it wasn't until eight months ago. And eight months ago, Mr. President, we saw, we saw that majority take its most radical decision yet when it overturned Roe versus Wade, stripping the American people of a fundamental constitutional right to make their own reproductive choices. A right that justices appointed by Republican and Democratic presidents had upheld for half a century, for 50 years. I have a colleague in this chamber that I love named John Tester, who's from Montana. He's a farmer. He's one of the last farmers in this place. He said to me, this was even before this happened. He said to me, my daughter is having to fight for things her mother never had to fight for because her grandmother won these freedoms. Her grandmother won these rights. And she won these freedoms and these rights when Roe versus Wade was decided half a century ago. I read on the way home to Colorado, well, I guess in honesty, I read, I read the decision. I'm sure my friend from Louisiana read it earlier, too, when it got leaked by the Supreme Court somehow, something that should have never happened, something that should never have happened. That's when I first read Justice Alito's opinion. But I, I had the chance to read it again on the plane on the way back to Colorado, and I was hoping that it would be different. Because the opinion that I read, had first read as a draft opinion, it just dripped 
drip with a cavalier dismissal of the right that it had destroyed. And when I reread it on the airplane, that's what I saw again. Justice Alito's opinion doesn't even have the courage to grapple with the fundamental nature of the right that it was stripping the American people of. It didn't contend with the simplest questions like what it would mean for millions of Americans, including for millions of American women like my three daughters. Justices Breyer and Kagan and Sotomayor expressed this in their dissent. They wrote the majority opinion lacked, quote, any serious discussion of how its ruling will affect women. It reveals how little it knows or cares about women's lives or about the suffering its decision will cause. That is a quote of the dissent in that opinion. Instead of grappling with the consequences of his ruling, which would have been, I'm sure, painful even for Justice Alito to deal with, just as it is for women all over this country and their families to deal with the aftermath of this decision every single day since it's been rendered. Justice Alito essentially wrote that if it wasn't right in 1868, it's not a right today. I mean, you got to give him credit. That is originalism. Although he's not going back to the Constitution, so to give him some credit, he's going back to the 14th Amendment. If it wasn't a right in 1868, it's not a right today, Mr. President. We ratified the 14th Amendment in 1868. That is the depth of the analysis in that opinion, which if you were guided only by originalist ideology, I suppose that would be what you would say. The dissenting justices pointed out that Justice Alito completely ignored that the men who ratified the 14th Amendment in 1868, and all of them obviously were men, did not perceive women as equals, did not recognize women's rights. Quoting them now in the dissent, when the majority says we must read our foundational charter as viewed at the time of ratification, it consigns women to second class citizenship. Of course it does. Women had no right to vote. Black Americans had no right to vote. The dissent continued, quote, because laws in 1868 deprived women of any control over their bodies, the majority approved states doing so today. Because those laws prevented women from charting the course of their own lives, the majority says states can do the same today. And that's exactly what we've seen, Mr. President, with one state after another treating Dobbs as a green light to obliterate access to reproductive care for millions of American women and families. And many of us have spoken about how the ruling has harmed the privacy, the health, the freedom of our fellow Americans, and all of those are important. And let me say also, you know, this is a difficult issue in my state, and I want the senator from Alabama to know that, and everybody to know that. It's a difficult issue for all the families across America. It's difficult for anybody who's been through this, and I am certainly not cavalier about how difficult this decision is and the fact that different people have different points of view, different people have different religious perspectives, different people come from different parts of the country. I've thought about these things a lot over the years. And my conclusion is that it's best to leave this decision in the hands of a woman and her, well, whomever she chooses to consult, her doctor or her family. That's my opinion. I respect the opinion of other people who disagree with me about that. And I realize that this is a heartfelt decision. But there's a reason why people have been out on this floor and other places talking about the effect on freedom, the effect on the right to privacy, the effect on the health of our 
fellow citizens because it has an unbelievable effect on all of those dimensions. But I don't think we have focused nearly enough on how the ruling will harm our national security, and that's what brings us here today. That's what brings us here today at this unprecedented moment when a member of this body for the first time in American history has said, no, I'm not going to let a single person go through. I'm not going to let any of these flag officers go through because I, I am upset with the, the policy that the DOD has pursued, that, I, that the DOD is pursuing a massive subsidy on a, abortion care, the abortion travel pol agency that the DOD has become. And because I don't like that, I'm not accepting those characterizations of what the DOD has become, but because I don't like that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold hostage the promotion of flag officers at the Department of Defense. Over a million men and women serve in our armed force, supported by over 700,000 civilians in the Department of Defense. These are obviously moms and dads, sons and daughters, who volunteer to risk their lives to protect ours. But when our men and women in uniform volunteer to serve, When they heed the call and they say, sign me up, they don't get to decide where they serve. The Pentagon, Mr. President, can we have order in the chamber, please? Senate will be in order. Thank you. When our men and women in the uniform volunteer to serve, they don't get to decide where they're going to serve. The Pentagon decides that. You can't sign up and say, well, I'd like to be in Colorado, or, well, I'd like to be in Alabama, or I'd like to be in a state where, you know, my reproductive health care is going to be covered, or a state where it's not. Before Dobbs was decided, our troops had at least some assurance that wherever the Pentagon sent them, they would have minimal access to reproductive care as a protected constitutional right. They knew that for 50 years, Mr. President. For 50 years, for 50 years, no matter where they serve, that is no longer true. The Supreme Court stripped that right away, again, without even bothering to consider what it would mean for our troops based in states with no access to reproductive care. Justice Alito doesn't deal with that in his decision. After Dobbs, one of the first calls I received was from a woman who once served as a senior officer in the Air Force. She immediately grasped how Dobbs was going to affect our military readiness. And that's what this is about, our military readiness. She understood, as I would say thousands of women in this country understood, how disruptive it is to force women in uniform to travel from their duty station to access care, to say nothing of the cost to her privacy when every single person in her unit finds out about it. Knows about it. Unlike any other, any other medical procedure. that we give people leave for, that people can get, you know, paid travel for. The privacy issues here are seismic, and the military readiness issues as a result are seismic too. Women are the fastest growing part of our military. They are about a fifth of our total force and over a third of our civilian workforce. It is not hard to see why they might think twice before enlisting if they know they're going to be stationed somewhere that doesn't respect their reproductive freedom. The senator from Alabama talked about how the DOD is having the worst recruiting they've had for generations. He's right. That's true. It's hard to see how this is going to help. And you don't have to take my word for it. A recent study from RAND 
concluded that Dobbs could increase attrition, decrease readiness, and hurt national security. And that's after the Pentagon had its worst recruiting season, as the senator from Alabama suggested, since the Vietnam War. And in an attempt to deal with these issues, two weeks ago, the Pentagon admit, ad, announced three new policies. And here's what they were. By the way, I apologize to my colleagues who are here, because I know you are here to do this other speech. I delayed for 24 hours or more, so I'm going to just continue, and I <laughs> will beg your forgiveness. Um, but these are the three things that have brought the Senate to a halt. These are the three things that have created an unprecedented objection to flag officers of the Department of Defense being approved in, a, in, a, in, the, in the common way that they have been approved in this body for 230 years. The first of these policies authorizes travel allowances for service members to access reproductive care if it's unavailable at their duty, duty station. And that's important because they may not be able to afford to travel, which is why we pay for procedures, other procedures like LASIK eye surgery or to remove a bunion, that none of which seems to have gotten the objection of anybody in this body. The second allows service members to take absences without leave to access reproductive care. This recognizes, I think, the difficult choice a woman has to make in incredibly, profoundly challenging circumstances. LASIK surgeries aren't banned in Alabama or Connecticut. The last policy extends the time before service members have to tell their commanding officers before, before um, about a pregnancy. It gives them just a little bit more time to deal with the shock that can come when somebody has an unexpected pregnancy and is trying to make a decision about what to do. This says that rather than get you in a position where you might find yourself, you know, feeling like you can't tell your superior officer the truth, this says take a little bit more time so you can think about it. That's what these three provisions do. That's what these three guidelines do, these rules do. It's about giving women in uniform the time and the privacy to decide if they want to carry a pregnancy to term or not, a decision that anybody on this floor, no matter what they think about this, surely can understand has become more complicated in the wake of Dobbs. So I applaud the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Austin, for taking these steps to protect our soldiers, our sailors, and our Marines. He's in a difficult position. It's hard to do because you know, I don't think many people were expecting that this would actually happen, and yet it has. And instead of welcoming this leadership from the Secretary of Defense, some of my Republican colleagues have attacked these proposals. They've ca called them, I'm now not quoting the senator from Alabama, I'm quoting others that have written about this, they've called them disgusting, they've called them heavy-handed, they've called them disastrous. I could be wrong, certainly been wrong before, but I don't think the American people would consider it disgusting or disastrous that women in uniform don't have to dig into their own paychecks and use their limited leave to seek care that's unavailable because of where our government required them to deploy. I think fundamental fairness would say that's a reasonable reaction to the disruption that's been caused by the Supreme Court. Now, I am quoting a senior senator from Alabama when I say, quote, the Secretary of Defense is following through with his radical plan to facilitate thousands of abortions a year 
with taxpayer dollars. So I will follow through with my plan to hold all DOD civilian flag and general officer nominations that come before the U.S. Senate. Okay, let's just hang, let's just hold up there for one second. Thousands. The, the senator was down here the other day saying, this is not a readiness problem because it's only 20 abortions that DOD paid for last year. Well, I don't know the facts of every one of those abortions. I do know the fact of the DOD policy with respect to abortion on paying for it, and that is cases where there's been rape, incest, or the life of the mother is at stake. And maybe that's what those 20 were. But the, the senator from Alabama himself says that what we're talking about here in the context of the rule is what he calls thousands and thousands of abortions that he's saying are subsidized by DOD because the DOD is willing to pay for the travel of women to go from a state that's banned abortion to a state that has it. I don't see how that's not, how could that not be a matter of readiness when you're talking about thousands of people? Senator from Alabama said, the American people want a military focus on national defense, not facilitating a progressive political agenda. I could not agree more, could not agree more with the senator from Alabama. The American people want a military focused on national defense. And, and for that reason, that's why I find it so hard to imagine that the American people would tolerate any senator holding up critical national security personnel to impose their ideology. The senator from Alabama correctly says that abortion is illegal in his state. I read some polling data that shows that 55% of Alabamians actually support a woman's right to choose, but that's neither here nor there in terms of the law in Alabama. The Senator from Alabama is right about that. Abortion is banned there. In Alabama, abortion is banned at any stage of a pregnancy. It has no exceptions for rape or for incest. Under Alabama law, doctors can face up to 99 years in jail if they perform an abortion. Last month, an Alabama state legislator announced a bill to treat abortion as murder. The state's attorney general suggested using a chemical endangerment law, a chemical endangerment law, a law designed to protect kids from methamphetamines to prosecute women for taking a bill to terminate her pregnancy. That's the law, that's the debate that's going on in Alabama. I recognize that Alabama has made certain decisions about this issue that are different from the ones that Colorado has made. We were the first state in America to decriminalize abortion in 1967. That was the state of Colorado, a western state, five years before Roe versus Wade was ever decided. In Colorado, we believe these decisions belong between a woman and her family and her doctor, and we don't accept that the government should impose itself on that private decision. And of course, that's not just what I believe, it's not just what Colorado believes, that's what the large majority of American, the American people believe. That's what the American people believe. But I acknowledge that Alabama has made a different choice. But what I can't accept is that its senator would impose that choice on every woman and family in our armed services who happen to be stationed in his state or any state that doesn't protect access to reproductive care. Because it's not just Alabama, Mr. President. It is not just Alabama. 18 states have banned abortion. Nine of them, nine of them, have no exceptions for rape or incest. And many states have only begun their war on a woman's right to choose. Just yesterday in Florida, Mr. President, which is home to 22 military bases, 22 bases where men and women 
in the United States who signed up to, to fight or to, to join our military have no choice about whether to serve. Governor DeSantis committed just yesterday to sign a six-week abortion ban. He may be unaware. I haven't talked to him about it. I don't know. He might be unaware that one in three women don't even know that they're pregnant until around six weeks. Or maybe he does know that. I don't know which would be worse. Texas is passing, ten, posting $10,000 bounties to any resident who successfully sues a doctor or nurse for performing an abortion after six weeks. Or even someone who just drives their friend or relative or, or neighbor to have a procedure, a procedure that for the last 50 years, until this radical originalist majority came into the court, that for the last 50 years, for almost my entire lifetime, has been a constitutionally protected right in this country. And all of us can remember who's in this chamber, in the aftermath of Dobbs, has state legislators all around the country wrote laws restricting the freedom of female citizens to travel from states like Texas or Alabama that had banned abortion to a state like Colorado that had ratified a woman's right to choose. And now we have senators here who aren't content to merely deprive service women of reproductive care if they're based in a state where abortion has been banned. They want to make it even harder to travel to another state to avail themselves of that care. From the vantage point of my daughters, from the nearly six million people who live in Colorado and the vast majority of Americans who support a, a woman's right to choose, I think there is a real question here whose position is radical. When the military pays for servicemen to travel from one state to another, if they need LASIK eye surgery or a sinus procedure or to remove a bunion on their foot, is it really radical to imagine that service women should have the right to travel? To have that travel, the price of that defrayed so they could get reproductive care. And that's just the debate that we're having. I mean, that says nothing about why we're actually here today, which is the vehicle that the senator from Alabama is using to delay the vote of every pending nominee and promotion at the Department of Defense. At a moment when we've got the, the biggest land war in Europe since Second World War, China's saber rattling in the Pacific. If you told most Americans that a single senator in this place was delaying every nomination and promotion at the DOD, all for the privilege of making it harder for service women to travel for reproductive care or take leave for that care or shorten the time a woman has to make a choice about her reproductive health before she has to tell her commanding officer. And those are the, those are the facts of what these rules do. If you had told America that was happening on the floor of the Senate, I don't think they would believe it. I don't think they would accept it. And maybe that's the reason why it's never happened before. Coloradans wouldn't accept it. Like the senator from Alabama, we, we in Colorado are honored to host a strong military presence in our state, from the U.S. Air Force Academy to Fort Carson to Schriever to Peterson to Buckley and Space Command. And we're honored to protect the reproductive care for the men and women who protect us. And in the case of Space Command, we have a live example I'm sad to say of how the Supreme Court's decision could harm our national security. I will not go through the whole story today. I will spare the
the senator from Alabama and Louisiana and everybody else who's here this painful, I describe it as the saddest story I know. But here's the essential point. In the waning days of the last administration, I think Donald Trump, President Trump had nine days left. Our top generals recommended Colorado as the top choice for Space Command's permanent headquarters. But President Trump overruled them and said it should go to Alabama. He later went on the radio and he said, they all were against me. They all said it ought to go to, it ought to, go to Colorado, but I overruled them and I said it should go to Alabama. Now look, I do not think that's how we should be making basing decisions in this nation. Every single person who's looked at this Space Command issue knows what the generals recommended and they know they were overruled by the President of the United States for his own political purposes. We need to make these decisions according to the national security interests of the United States, not in the political interests of a president. And that's why over and over I've called on the Biden administration to restore integrity to this process and honor the general's original recommendation. They should have made that decision two years ago after President Trump made this decision in the last few days of his administration overruling these generals, the experts who know where Space Command should be. But, but my specific issue with Space Command has led me to a much broader concern as I've studied this, this issue. In the wake of Dobbs, we ha literally have no policy to account for the harm of moving a base from a state that protects access to reproductive care, like Colorado, to a state that does not, like Alabama. We're now living in a world where the Pentagon makes basing decisions according to criteria like the number of parking spaces, or the quality of schools, or the availability of childcare. All of those are, I would, relevant decisions, important decisions, questions to ask. But one question they're not asking, Mr. President, is about basic reproductive health care in a country where it has been legal, where it has been a fundamental constitutional right for the last 50 years, where the majority of the American people, the majority of people in Alabama, support. They're not asking whether a state prosecutes women who seek an abortion or imprisons doctors for 99 years for performing one or turns residents into bounty hunters against women. It is ridiculous that they would be parking, counting parking spaces and not reflecting on what this world looks like for people in our armed services, especially women and their families post-Dobbs. I can't agree that the Pentagon should care about how much it costs to house a family when it makes basing decisions, but not whether the family has a freedom to plan its future. And the Supreme Court may not have had, because of its ideology, may it not have had the courage to grapple with the consequences of its ruling on our men and women in uniform and on our national security, but that doesn't give us the ability or the Department of Defense reason to shirk its responsibility. We have to stand on the side of expanding rights and expanding opportunity for Americans, not restricting them. So today I'm calling on the Pentagon to codify the policies it announced last month and develop a new framework that accounts for access to re reproductive care and its basing and its personnel decision. And I call upon my colleague from Alabama to lift his holds so the Senate can advance these national security personnel. Because if the men and women, if our men and women in uniform can spend every day defending our freedom, surely, Mr. President, we can defend theirs. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Alabama. Mr. President, I think we got a little off track here. Uh, 
I'm getting back to the objection a little bit. Uh, I don't think there's anybody in here said anything to do with doing away with abortion. Uh, the Department of Defense has for years had a policy uh, about abortion in the military. My problem is they've changed it. And the last time I looked, the people who make laws are not the Supreme Court, not the Pentagon. It's this place right here. We make the laws. And they've done abortions for years in the military for rape, incest, and harm to the mom through health. They want to change this to where a third party has said thousands and thousands would start getting abortions, and not just through the military personnel, but also their dependents. Now, this is about who's paying for this. The American taxpayers are not told, or shouldn't be told, they have to pay for abortions. That's not the way it's written. Military should not be paying for abortions. So, as we got off track there a little bit about what we're talking about, we're talking about a new policy based not on facts, but on conjecture from the Department of Defense that they're going to do it on their own without coming through this body. And a little bit about Spacecom, as a good senator from Colorado brought up. You know, it's unfortunate that members from states that weren't really even running for Spacecom headquarters are trying to tie completely unrelated political issues to a fact-based decision. Spacecom and the DOD abortion policy have nothing to do with each other. I don't recall abortion being part of the Air Force selection process a couple of years ago when they called me and said, Coach, we're going to put Spacecom in Huntsville, Alabama. The decision to put Spacecom in Huntsville was based on facts and facts alone and evidence of what the best for the military and for our country and our national defense, that's the reason they chose it. That decision was then reconfirmed by multiple independent studies for the last couple of years. The DOD Inspector General and the GAO confirmed that Huntsville was the number one location for Spacecom based on things like workforce, existing infrastructure, education, and the cost of living. Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville is far and away the best place for Spacecom. This is not my opinion, it's fact. It's fact from several studies. Attempts to change that with progressive talking points are shameful and purely political. It's really a shame. I yield the floor to my colleague from Louisiana. Uh, Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President. Senator, Senator, from, Senator from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. President. First of all, I would say with respect to my colleague from Alabama, I appreciate um, I appreciate his arguments here. Um, uh, he first says that DOD doesn't have the, um, the ability to do this, that somehow this is up to Congress to, to pass a law to make sure that uh, service members that need to travel for a, uh, a reproductive health care um, have it paid for them, not the, not the abortion, by the way, which the, the senator from Alabama said that, that that's inaccurate, but the travel um, uh, is, is his argument. And, and, and the reality is that um, DOD, it's clear, can pay for service members to travel for LASIK eye surgery. Current law doesn't say that. Uh, they can pay to have a bunion removed. Current law doesn't say that either. But what this is, and none of, all of that has happened without complaint from this body because it makes sense that DOD has discretion to provide the care it believes its service members require. And they are making those regulations as part of, of the law that they've been granted from our, uh, our, 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 our branch of government uh, to, to make sure they care for our service members. So I think that's point one. Point two, the, the senator from Alabama talked about you know, this is about who's paying for abortions. This is not about who's paying for abortions. This is about those three changes to the law I mentioned earlier. I won't in the, because I know my colleagues have lost, are gonna lose their minds over my staying here. Those are three things. One is travel. One is, you know, being able to take a little bit of a longer time to talk to your supervisor. 
those kinds of things. So, so it's not about paying for abortions. Although I will say that in another, the, the, the senator from Alabama has another uh, piece of legislation that he has introduced that objects not to the DOD, but to the VA. He says, this is radical. The VA has said, we have noticed that our policies that allow us to pay for abortion when the life of the mother is at stake don't also include ex exceptions for rape and incest. And we're going to add those exceptions for rape and incest. And the senator from Alabama has brought that to the floor and said he wants to have a vote. I want to have a vote on that, too. I can't wait to see how every single senator in this chamber stands on the senator from Alabama's position that protecting people, having the VA add cases of rape and incest to the exceptions that allow it to pay abortion is not somehow abortion on demand, or abortion, as some people have said, abortion after people have already had the child, but is simply adding two things that probably 80% of the American people agree with. And then on the last point on Space Command, decided on the facts, let me tell you something. Here are the facts as I understand them. The generals said they thought Space Command should stay in Colorado. The generals and the Secretary of the Air Force went to the White House with the recommendation of Colorado. The President of the United States, Donald Trump, overturned that recommendation on their advice. He went on the radio, the Ricky and Bubba show, I think it's called, in Alabama, where he said everybody was for Colorado or everybody was against me on Alabama, but I made the decision to send it to Alabama. Those are the facts on Space Command. And it's not off topic. You know, it's not off topic. That was a political decision that should never have been made. If the politics had not entered in that decision, the generals would have gotten their way, Space Command would be in Colorado, and we wouldn't be having the conversation we're having today because no one in Colorado would be having their abortion rights stripped from them because they were being sent to another state that's banned abortion, where doctors can go to jail for 99 years because they perform an abortion, where laws that are meant to bring down folks that traffic in methamphetamine are being threatened to be used against women who use a chemical version of abortion. And this is not a complaint I have with the senator from Alabama. This is my complaint with the White House. You should have dealt with this two years ago. And now I hope this administration will deal with, in the wake of Dobbs, this daily gray area that's tearing at the emotions and the well-being of members of our armed forces who don't get to decide where they're stationed. Alabama can have whatever law it wants. That's not up for me to decide. I respect that. There are the differences in this country. But people in this body have a duty and a responsibility to the men and women of this armed service, of the armed services. And we have a duty and responsibility to fulfill our duty and responsibility, which is not to hold up the promotion of flag officers at the Department of Defense, because I have a position that's different from what others may think. That's what I think. I yield to the senator from New Orleans, from Louisiana. President. Senator from Louisiana is recognized.